Good evening. And let me welcome you all uh, to our meeting tonight, as Mike has already done so, and you are singing well, and we have some to sing about, haven't we? We have a great God and a wonderful Saviour. So you're very welcome in the Lord's name. Now we're going to speak to our great God in prayer. What a privilege that is. Let us pray. Our Father, as we bow before you, we know so deeply in our heart that we are not talking to the air, but we are talking to the great God. And we're talking to the God who answers. And Father, we have heard your voice. We have been answered by you over and over and over again. We gathered here on Tuesday. We prayed. We fasted. And this morning, a young girl trusted Jesus as her Savior. We have a God who answers. And so, O oh Lord, we are enthused today by this. And we pray that tonight in this meeting, we will hear of others trusting Jesus, taking that simple step. And Lord, we pray for help. Help the preacher. Help us, Lord, to make the message simple. And yet at the same time, Lord, we know the Holy Spirit will be doing a work unseen by us. And Lord, we thank you for the day and hour that the Spirit of God worked in the lives of many here. And we are glad. So, Father, we give our meeting over to you. We lay ourselves before you. And we pray that above everything else, we will have ears to hear what Jesus would say to us tonight. Lord, we ask these things. We ask them believing. And in Jesus' name, amen. We're thinking about uh, questions and some of you who were handed an invitation to come along and I know some of you have come in response to that and lovely to see that some of you have been here to every one of our outreach meetings. So this is the eighth one and we are thrilled by that and we thank you for that. So you'll be aware of the questions we've been thinking about. We asked, who is God? We asked, when did it all go wrong? We ask, where am I going? What is sin? Why am I here? Why did Jesus die? And this morning, the question we considered was, where can I find the truth? And if you've missed any of those and are interested, and those questions have sparked some curiosity in your mind as I read them tonight, they're all available on a YouTube playlist, and they'll also be on our Facebook page, so you can catch up with them. But tonight's question is, what is the way to God? What is the way to God? It's a good question, isn't it? And to help us answer that question, I think we need to find out what kind of God the God of the Bible is. The way some people talk about God, it would make you think that he was elusive, a God that hides away some kind of mystic hermit, and he never shows himself. And because of that, people think that God can't be known, let alone reached. Even religious institutions that, that claim to tell people about God, they, they make God appear inaccessible, unapproachable. Or perhaps they make God appear only accessible if you jump through certain hoops that they deem to be necessary. Maybe you came here tonight thinking, that's what I've been telling you to do. There's this, 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 and this. And if you do all of that and keep doing it till the day you die, you'll eventually meet God. Some people have complicated the whole matter of the way <clears throat> to God. And I hope tonight when you leave here, you'll realize that it's not complicated, it's simple. And if I haven't managed to do that, then uh, I've failed, I believe. But I want you to grasp that, that 
The way to God is simple. Because with all the mystery that some people give to access to God, you'd think you had to be Indiana Jones to get to God. You had to decipher some mysterious code and then drag yourself through some quagmire and you'd need to be nearly an acrobat to reach the throne room of God. No, the way to God is much simpler than that. And to prove that, I'm going to read a portion of God's word. And everything that we believe and hold to and has been a help to us can be traced to this book. It's not our own notions. It's not a Baptist notion. It's what we find in God's revealed word. And we're turning to Luke's gospel. So in your New Testament, you have Matthew, Mark, and then Luke. And it's the 23rd chapter. And it's a very important chapter because Jesus is on the cross. Or going to the cross. And that's one of the themes of this little place you're in tonight. Preaching Jesus and preaching the cross. And from verse 32 of Luke 23, we read this. And there were also two other malefactors, that's just lawbreakers, led with him, that's Jesus, to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors or criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. So immediately you have a picture in your mind, three crosses, Jesus in the middle. Then said Jesus, as he's looking to his father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him or mocked him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar or sour wine and saying, if thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription or an accusation was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors, which was hanged, reeled on him or mocked him and shouted at him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? We indeed, just there, they are saying we deserve to be here. For we receive the due reward of our deeds, our crimes. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily or truly I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. The sun was darkened. The veil of the temple was rent or torn in the, the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. Amen. We know God will add his blessing to that portion of Scripture. And the man I want to point you to tonight is the man that we often refer to as the dying thief. But of course, there were two dying thieves. So it's the repentant one. The other one didn't repent. Our question is, what is the way to God? And in this story, we have a wonderful example of an unbeliever who, physically speaking, was unable to do many things that religion would tell you you have to do in order to find God. This man was unable to do them. He's hanging on a cross. He couldn't be baptized. 
He couldn't be confirmed. He couldn't receive sacraments. He couldn't be catechized. He couldn't do good works. He couldn't give money. He couldn't go on a pilgrimage. He couldn't visit a shrine. He couldn't venerate an image. He couldn't make an offering. He couldn't join an order, even the orange order. You know, well-meaning people will tell you you must go through this right or that right or follow some program to find God. If they ever do that, point them to the dying thief. We've thought about what he couldn't do. But what could he do? He's on a cross, like Jesus, like the other criminal. He's very limited in what he can do. And that's why we need a simple gospel, isn't it? And that's why the gospel is simple. What did he have there at Calvary? that enabled him to come to God. Well, in short, we could say this, he had everything he needed. And I want you to remember that. He had everything there that he needed to come to God. In fact, in his case, all that he needed was right in front of his eyes. What was in front of his eyes at Calvary? He saw a death that wasn't his. Now he was dying. His co accused was dying, but he saw another death there that wasn't his. Why am I using that phrase? He saw a death that wasn't his. Well, let me explain something to you. And I'm only making a point here, so don't get lost in the detail. I'm taking you through your Bible from Genesis onwards, and I'm going to point out. But that's a feature of our Bible. That's a feature of being accepted by God. A death that wasn't ours. You go right back to the first sinners, the first offenders. And who were they? Adam and Eve. After they offended God, what did God do? God stepped in. God took the initiative. God covered them. And how did he cover them? He slew animals in order that they would be covered. A death that wasn't theirs. Go to the next generation, we find their sons, Cain and Abel. And Abel brought the best of his flock and sacrificed it to God. The deaths. That wasn't his. You go to Isaac on Mount Moriah. He might have died there on that altar that day. But God points Abraham, his father, to a ram. And the ram was sacrificed in Isaac's place. The death of another. A death that wasn't his. I think of Passover night in Egypt. Judgment was going to go through the land that night and all the firstborn in every family were under the threat of death. Except if the household took the blood of a lamb. A lamb had to die. The death of another. A death that wasn't theirs. You go to the instructions for the tabernacle in the wilderness and I'm not going to labor this because I don't want to lose anybody in these details. But the first thing you saw when you went into the tabernacle was an altar of burnt offering. A death that wasn't theirs. And all of these events pictured something. They looked forward to one death that was to come, and that was the death of Jesus. All of those things had symbolism attached to them. The people did it, and they did it in faith, but it all pointed towards one death, and that was the death of Jesus, who died for others, who died for you, who died for me. And that event took place at Calvary, and our dying thief, was there. He was there. 
He saw it before his very eyes. He saw all that he needed, all that people have ever needed before Calvary and needed since he was there. And he saw it. Oh, there were many things he couldn't do, many things he didn't have. But here was something he had. He saw before his eyes the death to end all death, really. The death that puts paid to death eventually. The death that gives life, even resurrection life, to the bodies of those who have died in Jesus. He was there. He saw it. And that's the way to God. A simple The death that wasn't yours, it was Jesus' death. God's lamb, the verse above my head, says it. The lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The way to God is a death that we did not die, but that his son died in our place. Well, when I think about that story, A lot of things come to my mind that I think are are helpful for us tonight. Because whenever I look at the story that we've just read about Jesus in the center cross and the criminals on either side, the first thing I see is division there at Calvary. We have Jesus in the middle and he's dividing the two men in that sense, but they're divided in another way. Because one of them repents and the other doesn't. You know, that's what divides this room tonight. It's not an aisle. It's not male and female, older and younger. What divides this room tonight are those who have repented and those who have not. That's what divides our world. One of the least racist books in all the world is the Bible because it talks about the whosoever. All have sinned. And the thing that divides this world is not race, not culture, not language. It is those who have repented and those who have not. That's how God sees our world. And then there's eternity. And that's how eternity is divided. Those who have repented and those who have not. Where are you? And all of that. There's an old course some of us learned in Sunday school, and it says, Three crosses standing side by side of broken law sign. Two for their own transgressions died, the middle one for mine. The cross divides. Jesus often spoke about signs of the times. In the end of the world, and he used some pictures to describe what the judgment would be like. And one of the pictures is the wheat and tares. There's only two categories. The wheat were those who were eventually taken in and stored safely. The tares were burned in the fire. And then there's the sheep and the goats. Again, only two categories. So there's division at Calvary. Because there be division at the judgment. There is what one thief saw. And there's what another thief missed. Oh, we don't want you to miss salvation tonight. We want you to get it. We want you to see it. And we hope that you will. And what was it that one thief saw as he was hanging on the cross. Unable to do all the things that religious people say you must do. Well, he saw that something wasn't right. He looks at the man in the middle cross and he knows that that man shouldn't be there. Jesus shouldn't be there. You see, a man called Barabbas should have been there. He was an armed robber. He was an insurrectionist, a terrorist we would call him today. He should have been there. That was for him. And one of those thieves knew something wasn't right. Not only that, when he looked at the person who was on the cross in Barabbas' place, he was puzzled. Why is this good teacher in the middle cross? 
Why is this healer, this miracle worker on the middle cross, why is he there? One became interested while the other couldn't care less. I wonder is that representative of people here tonight? One's interested. One's curious. But the other couldn't care less. There was division at Calvary. As I look at this story again, I also see that they were left without excuse at Calvary. We read there about the accusation that was put above the head of Jesus. Now, it's not the accusation the people who hated him would have liked to have written above his head. But for some reason, Pontius Pilate chose to write in three languages, this is the king of the Jews. Now, Pilate didn't know it at that time, but those words, of course, would end up being included in our scriptures. So there's a way in which we can say that it's a tiny portion of the word of God, although it hadn't been included in the word of God just at that moment. A tiny phrase. And if you think about that, that's all those two thieves had when they hung on the cross there beside Jesus. Just a line of scripture, just a line, just a phrase. But it was a statement, it was a powerful statement. This is the king of the Jews. One fact about Jesus. And the interesting thing is, one of those criminals believed it and the other didn't. You know, we know many facts about Jesus. Some of you have been brought up in homes where you have heard over and over the story of the way of salvation. You've heard all the Bible stories. You've heard messages like the one that's been preached tonight. You could maybe even preach to me. But what have you done with that great privilege? All that knowledge. All that advantage. What have you done with it? Because here's a man hanging on a cross and all there is is this line, this one statement about the man in the middle cross And he believes it. And the division's there again. His co-accused did not. We know he believes it because whenever he comes to say that the very short prayer that he prays to Jesus, the very short request that he makes, he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He got it. He realized that Jesus was who he claimed to be. And he believed it. There isn't only what he heard at Calvary, or what he saw and read at Calvary, but what he heard. Unlike a lot of the films that have been made about the life of Jesus and the crucifixion scene, they seem to play a lot of orchestral music and make it look very serene and peaceful and tranquil and thought-provoking. Calvary wasn't like that. If you visit Israel today in Gordon's Calvary, the, the place where Jesus was crucified, today it's now a bus terminal, but then it was equally busy. It was a thoroughfare. People were crucified in a very public place so that folks coming in and out of the city would be warned. They would see these crosses and they would realize that the Romans don't, aren't to be messed with. We read in this passage, there was mocking, there was laughter. He was being jeered. And historically, at executions, uh, even in the UK, even in France, in centuries past, it was a time of festivity. So there would have been a lot of voices that these men hanging on the cross would have heard. Mockery. Laughter. They would have heard religious men making their opinion known as well. That was happening. The cry was going up from the religious men We don't need him. We don't want him. He's not part of our plan. Away with him, was what they said in short. Many people are saying that today, aren't they? But 
In spite of all these voices, there was also the voice of conscience. I wonder, do you know what that's like? The repentant thief heard the inner voice of his conscience, and it wasn't very comforting because he knew he was a sinner. In fact, he says to his co-accused on the other side of Jesus' cross, we deserve to be here. He felt his need. He felt his sin. But thankfully, above all of these other voices, there was the voice of Jesus. And what a wonder that Jesus, from that position, in his own immense suffering, would take time to say to a criminal, today you will be with me in paradise. What a wonderful thing. What a beautiful thing. No excuse at Calvary. What's your excuse tonight? As I read this little story again, I see that there was doubt at Calvary. In verse 39, we read about one of the criminals who jeered Jesus. And this is part of what he said. If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. If the unrepentant criminal said if, he doubted Jesus was who he claimed to be. The term Christ is a reference to God's anointed and chosen one. It's, uh, it's really a continuation of the Hebrew Messiah, the saviour and deliverer that was expected. He didn't think Jesus was any kind of saviour, never mind his saviour. You know, what Jesus can do depends on who he is. What do you think of Jesus tonight? On the other side, the repentant thief, he says, this man has done nothing amiss. Oh, the revelation that he's getting in moments hanging there on a cross. He believes Jesus is who he claims to be. He believes that little portion of written text that makes one claim about Jesus. He believes it. And then he sees something else. There's something that's just emanating from Jesus. And it's hard to see how that could be because Jesus has been beaten and whipped and lashed, had the beard torn from his face. He is a bleeding mess. Away centuries before, the prophet said, marred more than any man. And yet he sees something in Jesus that it causes him to realize this man has done nothing amiss. This man's sinless. This man doesn't deserve to be here. At the end of the reading, didn't the centurion say, surely this was a righteous man? He was also looking at the torn and battered and beaten Jesus. One man grasped this important fact, the sinlessness of Jesus. And only a sinless saviour could be a sin-defeating saviour. Only a sinless saviour could carry the sin of the world because he had none of his own to carry. And that's how your sins and mine were laid on him. There was doubt at Calvary. Are you a believer or a doubter tonight? As I look at this wee story again, I realize there's also an impossibility at Calvary. Because the thief who didn't repent, he challenges Jesus and says, as we've read in that verse 39, save yourself and us. That was an impossibility. Because if Jesus had saved himself that day, you and I would be lost forever without, without hope. Didn't we begin our message tonight by saying that all of those other deaths pointed to this one death. This death had to happen. Jesus had to die. So Jesus couldn't do both because if he saved the sinner, he couldn't save himself. And that's what he did. He died with you in mind. 
with an imprint of your image on his mind. He died for you. The sinless one died for the sinner, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. God the Son took my place, became my substitute, bore my punishment. That's a wonder. Yes, there was an impossibility at Calvary. He couldn't save himself and us, so he saved us. There was conviction at Calvary. The repentant thief said, do you not fear God? And so what he was really saying was, I do. Do you not? And he's hanging on a cross. We thought of all the things he couldn't do, but now we're starting to see what he could do. And he feared God. When you've thought he would have feared the awful throes of the later stages of the pain of crucifixion, you eventually suffocate, you know. When you thought he would have feared the process of death, wouldn't you? He may even have feared what lay beyond death. But I think it's amazing how it's worded here. He feared God. You see, it's too late to fear God when you're in eternity. It's better to fear him now than time. Do you not fear God? One man hanging there feared God. Jesus himself said in Matthew 10 these words, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. You know, there's many as a person has been martyred for their faith And they knew the reality of that. Fear not them that kill the body, but they can't kill the soul. But rather, fear him who is able to destroy the soul in hell. Do you not fear God? So there was conviction at Calvary. But then there was this cry at Calvary. One would think that anyone who knew they were going to die would cry out to God. Do you know the shocking thing that I've discovered in now 12 and a half years of ministry is that there are people who, having sinned away their opportunities, when it comes to the days before they die, they still show no interest. They're looking death in the face. I wonder had the line been crossed years before? Had their decision been away with him years before? They could find no place for repentance, no interest in repentance. But here we find a simple prayer. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. It's not the sort of prayer, if I were to counsel you this evening for salvation, that I would say, would you pray this after me? Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. But it's what the the man prayed. He used what he knew. And that tells me something. It's not a formula of words that saves you. God's looking for your heart. He's looking for your heart response tonight. There are people who have been lying unconscious at the end, and I'm convinced there have been times when unknown to us, they have cried out from their heart and their lips didn't move. God's looking for a cry from the heart. This man hadn't time to call the clergy. But what could they have done? The Savior was there. In John 14, we read these words of Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. 1 Timothy 2 and 5. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. 1 John 2 and 1. We have an advocate with the Father, just one. And here's his name. Jesus Christ, 
the righteous. Hebrews 7 and 25 says, he, that is Jesus, ever liveth to make intercession for us. And in Acts 4 and 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. He didn't need a clergyman. He didn't need a rabbi. His words didn't need to be in a certain order. Jesus was there. Jesus was there. His heart had been turned. His prayer was simple. His faith was evident. He was looking to the Lamb. There's the prayer at Calvary. There was also urgency at Calvary. Notice what Jesus said. Today you will be with me in paradise. He was literally in the valley of the shadow of death. Today, you will be with me in paradise. He came at the 11th hour. Jesus was speaking here to a dying man. He was speaking as a dying man to a dying man. And that dying man had no guarantee of another day. You know, we're not hanging on a cross tonight. We're not even lying in a hospital bed tonight. And we all look to be pretty fit and able tonight. But just a few weeks ago, there was somebody who came to these meetings as a result of the invitations. And that dear man is now in eternity. That could be you. There's an urgency when we look at Calvary. One day, thief died that day and he died rejecting Jesus and did not go to paradise. One thief died that day looking to Jesus and Jesus assured him, you'll be today with me in paradise. God says, and he makes it even more simple, Look unto me and be saved. All the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. So, what's the answer to our question tonight? What is the way to God? The death of another. The death of Jesus. That's it. It has happened. So what do we do? We believe that when Jesus died, he died for us. He died for me. He died for you personally. Believe that you needed it. Believe that he is all he claimed to be, especially your saviour. It's all there. It's all there. It's so simple that many would rather work and try to impress God and try to boast in their self-righteousness than believe the simple truth. What about you tonight? What is the way to God? The death of Jesus. The cross. And he died for you. Don't miss it. And may the Lord use these words for his glory. For his name's sake. We're going to sing again and their last song asks the question, have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? And that's just a reference to his death on the cross for you. We'll stand as we sing and then we'll close in prayer and give thanks for the food and please, please do stay behind. And during that time or even as you go out the door if you haven't time to stay and you want to speak to me, Take that opportunity to do so. If we can help you in any way, we would be more than glad to do that. Let us sing.
Father, we are so glad that the Lamb of God died in our place. We're so glad that salvation is simple because it's all been done for us. And Lord, we pray that not only will we discuss the question, what is the way to God, but oh, that men and women in this meeting tonight would take that way. Lord, for our time of fellowship and for the good things provided, we pray you bless them to your use. We ask for journeying mercies for all as they eventually make their way home. And we just give you our thanks and praise that we have a wonderful Savior in whose name we pray. Amen.